Hello and welcome back to The Crime Reel. For this week's true crime story, we shall be looking at the life of William Bradford Bishop. He was known by his middle name, Bradford. He was born on the 1st of August 1936 in Pasadena, California. He was the only child of William Bradford Bishop Sr. and Lobelia Bishop. Bradford was an intelligent child who had a particular aptitude for languages. In 1950, when Bradford was 14, the soon-to-be famous American ballet dancer and choreographer Jacques Dumbois, who was 17 at the time, spent a short time living with the Bishop family in their Pasadena home. Lobelia, Bradford's mother, had a love of ballet and offered to help Jacques while he was performing with a travelling ballet troupe in the area. Bradford and Jack would play chess together and Jack remembers Bradford as someone who was super smart and analytical, intense and at times quite distant. Bradford attended the South Pasadena High School and during his time there he met a young lady by the name of Annette Weiss. Annette was born on the 14th of April 1938 in Toledo, Ohio. Together with her parents and brother Robert, the family had relocated to San Marino, California, where Annette also attended high school in South Pasadena. Annette was a cheerleader and Bradford was a quarterback on the high school football team and before long the pair began dating. Bradford graduated in 1954 and he went on to attend Yale and Annette graduated in 1955 and went on to obtain a degree from Berkeley. Following their college graduations, the pair married in San Clemente, California in 1959. Later that year, on the 7th of August, Bradford enlisted in the peacetime army and attended the army's military school in Monterey, California. Ultimately, he became fluent in multiple languages, including Italian, French, Serbo-Croatian and Spanish. On the 14th of August 1961, Annette gave birth to the couple's first son, who they named William Bradford III. Shortly afterwards, the family relocated to Europe when Bradford was assigned to work in counterintelligence in the former Yugoslavia. In 1963, when his four-year assignment in the army came to an end, he accepted an honourable discharge with a medal for good behaviour. The family then spent some time living in Italy, where Bradford completed a master's degree in Italian at the Florence campus of Middlebury College. The family then returned to California, where their second son, Brenton, was born on the 30th of July 1965. Further overseas postings followed, with time spent in various locations including Verona, Milan and Florence in Italy, Addis Ababa in Ethiopia and Gaborone in Botswana. During this time, Bradford's father died and his mother, Lobelia, then began living with Bradford, Annette and their boys. Bradford also obtained his pilot's license and a further master's degree this time in African studies. On the 12th of February 1971, the couple's third child, Jeffrey, was born. The family relocated to Washington in 1974 after Bradford became an assistant chief in the Division of Special Activities and Commercial Treaties at the State Department headquarters. Lobelia helped the couple financially enabling them to buy a contemporary split-level home in Bethesda, Maryland, where they all lived together. With Lobelia around to help with the three young boys, Annette had enough time to pursue her love of art and she began studying at the University of Maryland. Meanwhile, Bradford had some struggles adjusting to this new, more settled lifestyle and, bored with being confined to a desk job, wanted to pursue another overseas posting. He suffered from insomnia and bouts of depression and began taking medication to help with this. Annette, however, was reluctant to relocate yet again and was enjoying her newfound independence and the boys were becoming increasingly settled in their new surroundings. 
The family enjoyed camping, skiing and hiking and were members of the local community club where they played tennis and often went swimming. The whole family were very active and together with their golden retriever, Leo, seemed to have an idyllic lifestyle. Over the years, Jacques Dambois had remained in contact with Lobelia and on the 29th of February 1976, Jacques was scheduled to perform at the Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts. Lobelia invited Jacques and his wife Carrie to stay with her while they were in town. Shortly before his appearance, Jacques injured his foot and so was unable to perform. He forgot to tell Lobelia that he would no longer be staying with them. The following morning, 1st of March 1976, 39-year-old Bradford went to work as usual. However, during the day he found out that a promotion which he believed to be his had gone to a colleague instead. It had been the first hiccup in his otherwise flawless career. He decided to leave work early and told his secretary that he was feeling unwell. The next day, March the 2nd, a friend of the family, Alvina Long, went to the bishop house to pick up the boys and take them swimming. When Alvina arrived, no one was home and she guessed that the family had left on a spontaneous skiing trip which they had been known to do. However, eight days later, on March 10th, when the family hadn't returned and their mail had started to pile up, another neighbour decided to contact the authorities. When the police arrived to check the home on Lily Stone Drive, they were shocked by what they found. The walls, ceilings and floors in the front hallway and all of the bedrooms were covered in blood and pieces of human tissue. But there were no people or bodies in the house. The missing family was soon connected to a local hardware store, the owners of which had recently been contacted by the police in North Carolina. Eight days earlier, the fire department had been called to a forest fire in a densely wooded swamp in Tyrrell County in North Carolina. This was about 275 miles away from where the family lived in Bethesda. While attending to the fire, the bodies of two women and three boys had been discovered. The local police had been unable to identify these bodies, but they had also discovered a gas can, a shovel and a fork in the same area. A torn price tag on the shovel showed the letters OCH and eventually this was traced to Pox Hardware Store in Bethesda. In the hope of being able to identify the bodies, the police travelled to the hardware store and showed the owners pictures of the victims. However, no one knew who they were until the second crime scene, the Bishop House, was discovered. As the investigation continued, the police were able to piece together what they believed to have happened to the family. After Bradford left his office in Foggy Bottom on the day of the missed promotion, he drove to the nearby American Security Bank where he withdrew $400. From there he went to the Montgomery Mall in Bethesda where he bought a small sledgehammer and a petrol can. He then filled up both the can and his 1974 maroon Chevrolet station wagon with petrol. Following this, he bought a shovel and fork from a local hardware store. Pox. When he returned home that evening, it is believed that he beat his 37-year-old wife to death. She suffered extensive injuries. Then, when his mother, Lobelia, returned from walking the family dog, he also killed her. It is then believed that Bradford went to each of his son's bedrooms, beating them to death whilst they were sleeping in their beds. Again, their injuries demonstrated an excessive amount of overkill. After loading all five bodies into the station wagon, the police believe that Bradford drove for approximately 275 miles before arriving at the swamp in Tyrrell County. It is understood that he then spent a significant amount of time digging a deep hole about the size of a bathtub before putting five-year-old Geoffrey, 10-year-old Brenton, his wife Annette, 14-year-old William, and finally his mother into this hole. Rather than completely burying the bodies, which may then have never been found, 
he doused them with petrol before setting them alight. This fire soon spread out of control, leading to emergency services being called and the bodies being found. After this, Bradford went into a sports store in Jacksonville, about 150 miles away, and he purchased some tennis shoes using his credit card. He was accompanied by an unknown woman and what was believed to be the family dog. On March the 18th, 1976, 16 days after the discovery of the bodies, Bradford's station wagon was found abandoned at an isolated campground in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park, 400 miles away. The car contained a bloody blanket, a shotgun, axe, shaving kit, dog biscuits and Bradford's medication. The spare tyre well was full of blood. It is believed that the car had been in the area for around 10 days by the time it was reported. Assuming that Bradford may have joined hikers on the Appalachian Trail, the police tried to follow his scent using bloodhounds. This was unsuccessful. The following day, 19th of March 1976, a grand jury indicted Bradford on five counts of first degree murder. Those who knew the bishops, including Annette's brother Robert, were shocked as they had never seen any hint of a problem or violence within the family. Despite extensive searches, Bradford had simply disappeared. Over the years, there have been numerous sightings of Bradford throughout the US as well as in Italy, Sweden, Switzerland, Belgium, Africa, England, Finland, the Netherlands, Germany, Greece, Russia and Spain. The majority of this information, including some reports of Bradford's death, have been completely discounted, although three of these sightings are deemed to be far more credible than the others. In July 1978, a Swedish woman who had worked with Bradford in Ethiopia believed that she had seen him twice in Stockholm. This was not reported to the police as, at the time, the woman was unaware that Bradford was wanted for murder. The following year, in January 1979, a former colleague from the US State Department believed he saw Bradford in a public toilet in Sorrento, Italy. When he asked the man if he was Brad Bishop, the man replied, oh no, and quickly left. Fifteen years later, in September 1994, a neighbour who had known the family when they lived in Bethesda was convinced that they saw a well-groomed Bradford getting into a car in Basel, Switzerland. In 2010, authorities revealed that Bradford had been corresponding with a federal prison inmate, Albert Kenneth Bankston, before and at the time of the murders but it was unclear why the men were in contact and Albert died prior to this contact being discovered and as such was never interviewed about it. On the 10th of April 2014, 38 years after the murders, Bradford was added to the FBI's 10 most wanted fugitives. A reward of up to $100,000 for information which led directly to his arrest was offered and as part of the effort to use technology and social media to reinvigorate the case, a forensic artist created a three-dimensional, age-enhanced bust of what Bradford would then look like, aged 77. After four years, Bradford became the tenth person to be removed from the most wanted list without either being caught, dying, or the prosecutors dropping all charges. It was determined that the increased publicity would not help with the possibility of his capture. To this day, Bradford, who, if alive, would now be 84 years old, has never been found and exactly what happened to him has never been established. Many theories remain that, disappointed with his new life and being overlooked for promotion, Bradford snapped and killed his entire family in the method laid out by police and then used his extensive language and intelligence skills to evade capture for the rest of his life. Or maybe that after killing his family, he took his own life deep in the national park with his remains never being found. Others believe that his foreign service career may have been a cover for him working as a spy and his family had been targeted because of this. Or possibly, 
that Bradford was the sixth victim of a murder plot against his entire family, with his body being disposed of elsewhere in an attempt to deflect any suspicion away from the true murderer. Unfortunately, it would take nothing short of a miracle for this case to be solved after all this time. The authorities believe that Bradford is guilty of five murders, but it looks incredibly unlikely that him, or anyone else, will ever be brought to justice for this horrific crime. In Jacques D'Ambois's autobiography, he mentioned that he has always wondered whether events would have been different if he had not cancelled the visit he had planned for the time of the murders. Would it have postponed the murders, or maybe prevented them entirely? Or would he and his wife have become victims as well? Just a quick mention about a subscriber called Steph Carlo. He's from Texas, and he sends me emails from time to time. A while back I pronounced Marilyn as Maryland, and he kindly sent me a voicemail to help me out for the future. I've just checked with him and he's happy for me to share it. Have a listen to this wonderful voice and a wonderful ending. Oh, by the way, Crime Real is pronounced Marilyn, not Murderland. Marilyn. <laughs> Thanks so much for that, Steph. It's fantastic. If Steph laughs, you have to click the subscribe button. <laughs> hmm. Thanks, Steph. Please add your comments down below about this case. As always, I'll be interested in reading your views. Thanks very much for listening to The Crime Reel. Stay safe. Goodbye. <laughs> Psst. A recent article in the Washington Post revealed an American lady called Kathy Gilchrist. Kathy was adopted at birth and took a DNA test recently. As a consequence, she discovered her birth father is Bradford Bishop. Goodbye. <laughs>